I'm going to introduce to you the Hypertopia proposal, which is uh, my plan for protecting Jacques Cousteau's blue marble in space, which I think is well worth protecting. So uh, this is then hi the Hypertropia proposal, C, Hyper C, and Oases of Creation. OK. First, uh, let me introduce to you the Hyper C uh, uh, theory. Uh, and Hyper C represents all eukaryotic organisms on land and their symbionts. And so this should be thought of as a, as a geophysiological structure that covers the dry land surfaces of the Earth and uh, allows a tremendous expansion in the biodiversity of the planet and even more significant, significantly the biomass of the planet. Without hypersea, without the land biota, uh, we would have two orders of magnitude less biomatter on the planet. So hypersea represents a tremendous expansion in the amount of biomatter on the planet. And uh, part of the reason for this is because of this structure known as the arbuscle. The arbuscle is a modified fungal hyphae, hypha that uh, comes from a soil fungus and then goes into the root cells of a vascular plant and then branches and branches and branches inside of it. And this, it develops an enormous surface area, even though it's microscopic. And this huge surface area of the tiny arbuscle enhances nutrient exchange. Uh, in other words, uh, mineral nutrients uh, come from the fungus and are, are delivered to the vascular plant. The vascular plant delivers sugars to the fungus. And so there's a two-way exchange of nutrients here that's fundamentally based on the talent that fungi have for osmotrophy, absorbing nutrients from feldspar crystals and so forth. And then, of course, the photos uh, photosynthesis of the vascular plant. And the, these plants, of course, can produce much more sugar than they can use. So they pass this on to the fungus. This is the fundamental hyper-C uh, connection. OK, and it leads to this nutrient shuttle. You have a variety of fungal species below ground and a variety of plant species above and below ground. They are all interconnected. And nutrients, let's say potassium, are transported from one end of the forest to the other by the fungi. And uh, this, uh, this research on hyper -C proposes challenges to the Darwinian view of evolutionary change with its focus on individual organisms and, uh, <clears throat> and competitive interaction. And so, as I mentioned, hyper -C led to the greatest expansion of the biosphere known in the entire span of Earth history. Uh, and the biomass increases on the planet by at least two orders of magnitude, 100 times. And uh, this is a book that Diana and I, uh, my wife Diana and I, published uh, called Hypersea, Life on Land. Uh, Lynn Margulis wrote the foreword to this book. So I would direct you to this if you want to see a good uh, discussion of the, the hypersea theory. OK, now a here's the subterranean network where you have the connection, the key connectivity of the fungi that connect myriad species of vascular plants all connected to uh, uh, beneath ground fungi, such as the glomatian fungi. And it's not just one type of fun fungus, but many types of fungal genera will be tapped into many different types of vascular plants. And this is how, for example, a uh, a, a forest that has a potassium surfeit on one end and a potassium deficit on the other end will see transfer of the potassium in this direction to nourish the trees in the depleted end of the forest. And this uh, is how these organisms uh, work together to increase biodiversity and biomatter. OK, now here is the strange case of septobacidium, which is one of the most interesting cases in hypersea. It's an example that unites the animals, fungi, and plants on land. And in this situation, you have a scale insect that is invested by modified fungal hyphae. So you can sort of think of this as an animal arbuscle. The fungal uh, tendril or, or hypha has gotten inside of the insect. And so the insect is immobilized, but it's not killed. It's kept alive. And uh, the, these are the fungal arbuscles or coils that, that are inside of the body of the scale insect as it is uh, ensconced in this, this fungal chamber or this fungal condominium. 
And, and so here we see the septa basidium case in cross section. Here is a juvenile of the scale insect, almost looks like a trilobite. And, uh, <clears throat> and then here is the adult scale insect with its suctorial tube going down into the medullary ray cells <clears throat> of the uh, vascular plant, drawing up nutritious fluid uh, from the phloem, then this is, uh, nourishes the scale insect, of course, but then is also intercepted by the uh, coils of fungal hyphae that then nourish the septobasidium fungus. So we have this very interesting nutrient exchange, a, a sort of a hyper-C microcosm in this one case, and we have a septobasidium fluid transfer pathway from the arbuscles of the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil to the woody plant roots to the vascular system of the woody plant as it comes up uh, the, uh, uh, the tracheid tubes, then to the suctorial tube of the scale insect, and then to the fungal hyphae inside of the body of the scale insect. And also in some cases, you will have um, parasitoids. Uh, a uh, uh, wasp um, uh, larvae that will live inside of the scale insect at the same time that it has the fungi uh, investing it. So it becomes a very interesting uh, <coughs> sort of microcosm of organisms where the living fluids are being used as a kind of uh, aquatic environment. That's why we call it hyper-C. Okay, so this <coughs> the success of hyper-C, which really... Um, becomes fully formed at about 350 uh, million years ago, or maybe a little bit before that, uh, uh, leads to a, what I call a hypermarine sediment. It actually changes the geology of the planet because it, it uh, <coughs> begins to sequester so much carbon that a new type of rock appears on Earth, coal. And coal is essentially unknown as thick deposits uh, before the Devonian period, before about 323 million years ago. Here is a Pennsylvanian coal seam in Kentucky. There's my colleague Charlie Mason there uh, pointing it out. And it, it was formed <coughs> at a time when uh, hyper-C was really becoming active, was beginning to draw a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequestering it as coal. And this then leads to the permocarboniferous glaciation on the soup the supercontinent of Gondwana, you have the ice sheets beginning to form because hyper-C has been so successful at drawing down atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Very interesting uh, event, and, and we really need to listen to this lesson from Earth history. Okay, so we can see a couple of cases where this happens. Here are a couple of key points in Earth history. We have the snowball earth glaciation at about 750 million years ago. It seems to be carbon cycle linked, apparently is linked up with the breakup of, of the supercontinent Rodinia and giant stromatolites, which sequester a lot of carbon in their, uh, uh, their uh, carbonate uh, structure. And uh, as uh, Paul Hoffman here at Harvard has argued the snowball earth glaciation is probably driven by these tectonic and uh, biological factors, and it leads to the worst glaciation known in all of Earth history. Some estimates suggest that the planet was completely frozen over uh, with a, a thick ice sheet over the, almost all of the oceans. Then we have the Permatriassic mass extinction at 251 million years ago, which now is being uh, linked again to carbon cycle uh, changes. The Siberian traps eruptions uh, generated huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, probably led to oceanic acidification uh, of the sort that we heard about from the uh, homeschool symbiosis team. Yes, good work, guys. And this then led to the worst mass extinction known. Then we have the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum at 55.8 million years ago, more recently. And uh, this led to a 6 degree centigrade increase in global temperature over the relatively short span of 20,000 years. It may actually have been less than that. The reason for this is not entirely certain, but it may have to do with global warming that led to gas hydrate release by the breakdown of clathrates beneath permafrost and in the sea floor. And in any case, a traumatic event. And we see that um, 
perturbations to the carbon cycle can uh, lead to fairly dramatic effects on our uh, blue marble in space. And a key element of humanity's stewardship of the planet would seem to be that we are called to serve as, as a benevolent global thermostat. So let's get to work on that and see what we can do. OK, now, more lessons that uh, not from uh, the distant past or deep time, but from the more recent past. And this is a zoonotically induced reforestation event. Um, Post-Columbian colonization of the New World led, very tragically, to the demise of Native American populations. The demise uh, and the loss of these populations were due to literally dozens of zoonotic diseases. Uh, these are diseases that are, that are transmitted from animals to humans, infecting European human populations that had lived in close contact with their livestock. We Europeans would live with our animals in the barn, in the house with us, and we would get diseases from them. And there are literally dozens of these diseases, measles, the flu, et cetera, uh, from our livestock animals. And with, when this came to the New World in the, uh, uh, the Colombian exchange, uh, the result was catastrophic for Native American human populations. And this had a, an interesting result, which was cessation of hunting grounds management, or the annual burns that the Native Americans would do over much of eastern North America. And as a result of that, there was a blanket reforestation of the eastern United States, which consumed massive amounts of atmospheric carbon dioxide and threw us into the Little Ice Age. So a human-related uh, uh, event then changed the carbon budget and threw us into the Little Ice Age. Very interesting. It suggests, though, that there is a thermostat that we can get a hold of on this planet. I agree. Let's do it. And I'm going to show you how. Right. Let's do it. <laughs> I agree. I think it can be done. But it's going to, be a, it's going to have to be a full spectrum thing. Okay? It has to be full spectrum. We can't, we can't be insular about this. It really has to be global a global solution. OK, so I, <clears throat> I just hired Sam Tuttle at Mount Holyoke. And he is our new visiting professor of data science and geology. And he, I've le already learned some interesting things from this bright fellow. And uh, two of Sam's discoveries, one counterintuitive, are going to import be important for us here. First, he has noted that in the dry western United States, Relatively wet areas gain more rainfall. So if you have some moisture there already, it's going to attract more. Here in the east, in the moist eastern USA, relatively dry areas gain more rainfall. That seems counterintuitive. But it is so because the dry areas heat up faster, uh, causing the air to rise and drawing in moisture-laden uh, air from surrounding uh, yeah, anyway, from surrounding areas. So the, uh, uh, if you have a dry area, it heats up faster. It's not trying to heat up all that water and create water vapor. That then draws in moisture from the side. Sorry, the bottom, that's like a cutoff. OK, so <clears throat> what that implies then is that <clears throat> we have areas on the planet that are potentially exploitable in terms of increasing the forestation of the planet. So these red areas, and I'm particularly thinking here of the western United States. And then also, the blue areas that are cool, but which are going to be going into warmer climate zones as global warming increases, both the red and blue uh, are potentially uh, areas where reforestation could take place. And this could, uh, by the uh, Colombian exchange example, potentially have a beneficial impact on the global carbon budget. OK, so I would call this hypermarine climate control. Now, we know that the Little Ice Age and the permocarboniferous global coolings indicate that hypersea can influence global cl climate in an ice house direction. So we know that can happen. The effect is valid at a variety of time scales, historical time, evolutionary time, and geologic time. So we've got, we've got something to work with here. OK, now I have to introduce to you five salient points that we have to keep in mind if we're going to, uh, to, to pull this off. OK, salient point number one, lessons from the field. 
Now, when I was working in, uh, in paleontology and geology in northwestern Sonora uh, in 1982, it was a sort of a very dry Choya desert. There were open sandy, sandy areas and desert pavement areas. Then I returned to continued work in 1995, and the desert had changed. There had been a shift in rainfall patterns, and all kinds of stuff, vegetation had grown up. I hardly recognized it. And uh, while I was searching for the fossils, I was walking along, and I stepped in a sagebrush, but there was, was a choya inside of it, and it stabbed me right in the ankle. So as you'll read about in uh, the Garden of Ediacara, I pulled out this Leatherman tool, and I pulled the choya spines one by one out of my ankle. Ouch, it really hurt. This was bloody at the end of this. But it was worth it there because then I continued to hike very slowly. And then I discovered the oldest Ediacaran and animal fossils uh, near the Cerro Rajon. And I really wouldn't have found them if I hadn't been moving really slowly and kind of limping. <laughs> so I have a, uh, uh, I have, Climate change and uh, enhanced precipitation in this region of Mexico to thank for that discovery that uh, you can read about in Garden of Ediacara. And I concluded from that that slight increases in precipitation in desert areas can dramatically and quickly alter the vegetation cover. I saw it with my own eyes and Mark, felt it. Yes? Can you say briefly what Ediacara is? Oh, Ediacara, yes. <clears throat> the Ediacarans are a, an enigmatic group of organisms from before the Cambrian boundary. So in strata, marine strata from before 542 million years ago. And they include a variety of fascinating forms of creatures. They're almost entirely soft bodied. And there's still debate in, in geology and paleontology as to whether they represent the earliest animals or whether they represent some very unique group that has completely gone extinct, uh, what Dolph Sylocker would have called a sixth kingdom of life that has vanished from the planet. Very interesting. And if you read Garden of Ediacara, I talk about all the different types and uh, the, uh, uh, the various controversies surrounding the Ediacara and fossils. Sale. Yes, it's on sale in the back table there. Yes. <laughs> Plug for the book. Okay. So salient point number one. You can change the vegetation in the desert fairly quickly. OK, salient point number two, local management is a plus. OK, here's where we can really contribute, I think, to the, the, the health of the planet. Bright spot coral reefs are those that are doing better than otherwise expected in studies of the global, very sad global decline of coral reefs. They are doing better as a function of local man management, as according to Joshua Sinner. This includes active fishery management by local people. So if the locals are aware of the local environment and they are able to manage it, it's going to do better. And so we know that this works with uh, coral reefs. Let's move that onto land. OK, salient point number three. Trees can cause increased precipitation. The forested areas have to be large enough to get this effect. And the additional precipitation is due to largely to temperature reduction, but other factors can involve as well. And so this is what I call the Sam Tuttle effect. Uh, the precipitation is most strongly enhanced by forestation in arid regions. So that's salient point number three. Yes, sure. I don't know. We need to find that out. <laughs> so that is, a, I would consider, a absolutely critical piece of research that we need to address right away. Do you know how, we're gonna, how, how small? George, we're going to have a Q&A after this. Yeah. I, I can make some guesses, but I just don't know at this point. That's something I, that I really, someone out in the audience may be able to help us with this, or we need to address it experimentally with a, 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 a sort of a pilot hypertopia, as I'll explain in a moment. OK, so <clears throat> salient point number four, piping in water. The British Palestine colonial governments felt that Palestine had only enough water to support a population of two million people. The Negev Desert was thought to be inhospitable to human habitation, a wasteland, according to Seth Siegel in Let There Be Water. And uh, here's a quote from Elisa Finley's uh, 
a review of that book, How to Make a Desert Bloom, uh, Jewish pioneers recycled pipes that the British had used to put out fires during the Blitz to uh, transport the water to others. The discarded British pipes, first used to frustrate Hitler's effort to terrorize the peoples of London, now assisted settlement construction, uh, writes Mr. Siegel. So we know that this, this, you know, if you can get the water to the place, you're going to do much better in terms of supporting human population. Salient point number five, mutual aid happens. Okay, a Russian prince and a scientist, uh, Pyotr Kropotkin, was fascinated during his scientific expeditions to Siberia by his observation that in order to survive in a hostile environment, the organisms must aid each other. Lynn Margulis and I used to argue about this. You know, is there a mutualism or a mutual aid? She may recall, she was sometimes negative on that, but I disagree. I think that there is actual, a, actually mutualism in, in biology, and we need to, to keep that in mind. Uh, and, and in reply to Thomas Huxley's Darwinian essay, The Struggle for Existence, Kropotkin wrote Mutual Aid, a Factor of Evolution in 1902. This was an important piece of the ongoing Russian challenge to the fallacies of Darwinian evolution. If we do our work well here, now, today, the Russians will get on board. They're really smart and uh, well-meaning, I think, fundamentally. And if, uh, and, and if we point the Russians to their own best tradition, they're gonna join us in this. Okay, Kropotkin's conclusion, community success depends on mutual aid and cooperation among organisms in the face of a challenging physical environment. Okay, salient point number six, the wonder, oh, that got cut off, that's supposed to be fuel. The wonder fuel. Usage of oil and gas is not going to vanish anytime soon. Uh, <clears throat> oil is in many ways a wonder fuel due to its energy-rich chemical makeup. For example, no battery cell in principle can ever approach the ounce-for-ounce ounce energy delivery of gasoline. It's just, it's a wonderful fuel, it really is. And the, the United States Geological Survey just announced the Wolf Camp Shale discovery of 20 million barrels of oil and 16 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. This is the greatest discovery in U.S. history. Okay, great for the economy, yes, but for the climate, we have to begin to wonder, or continue to wonder. And so clearly we have an acute need for an economically viable carbon sequestration. The oil and gas is there, it's there to stay. We're gonna to have to work with that and find a, an economically viable way to sequester that carbon. Okay, so hence the hypertopia proposal. And here are the four steps for hyper, hypertopias that I'm outlining here. Okay, step one is to identify arid and underforested regions of the world, such as the Great Basin and Range in the western United States, and that would extend into Mexico, where I was. Step two, build quail guzzlers and related structures to capture the rare rainfall in the area. I helped build these in the 1970s out in the Mojave Desert, so I know they work. Um, step three, pipe in water from distant regions once a more favorable hydrological society, uh, cycle is locally established, then you can begin to exploit groundwater sources, but I wouldn't do that until you had the hypertopia already in place. Uh, in certain areas, desalin desalinization is potentially also an option. Step four, combine arid land reforestation project with a new human habitat areas. These are the hypertopias built from the ground up with the best available uh, uh, Tech, modular technologies. And so if you're starting from the ground up, you can use all the good stuff and you're not constrained by the historical factors of already having buildings in place there. So we can put in super insulation like Amory Lovins does in his at, in Snowmass, Colorado. We can do the heat mirror glass, which, should, which was used in the space shuttle to keep out the cold of interstellar space. This should be much more widely used. And, um, and a solar, of course, and other things can be put in right from the ground up as you start these new, new things. And uh, uh, by the way, the name Hypertopia is, I'm borrowing this from Yale Film Studies professor Francesco Cassetti in his study of the semiotics of cinema. The city and its moving images, Hypertopia. And he uses this in the sense of trying to get the big stage theater um, <coughs> experience down onto your iPhone or down onto your small device, your iPad or something like that. So he's really thinking about miniaturizing but still retaining the feel. And this is sort of similar to that. We're trying to uh, uh, retain the feel 
of uh, the entire biosphere in our small restricted hypertopias at first before they become very widespread. Okay, hypertopia's main benefit is going to seem, a again, a little counterintuitive, but I think the main benefit here is that if hypertopia nurtured forests become too successful, in accordance with Vladimir Vernadsky's, Russians again, his idea of the pressure of life, they can be scaled back by harvesting the timber or otherwise moderating the rate of carbon sequestration. So we won't be a victim, necessarily be a victim here of our own success. We can really modulate this. This may currently seem to be the least of our worries, but recall that there is an ice house disaster scenario, Little Ice Age Snowball Earth, as well as its torrid alternative like the Perma-Triassic and the N-Triassic and the uh, Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. The hypertopias uh, provide us the means to nurture a symbiosis-supported biodiversity, plus they provide us with a throttle we can use to control atmospheric carbon dioxide. This can easily offset fossil fuel carbon emissions, so there are, there's no need for economically disruptive, coercive measures in terms of fossil fuel usage. Okay, so no governmental coercion required, either local or global. I served as a water commissioner in district number two, South Hadley, and I learned some important things from that experience. First, local governments will respond favorably when the situation works in favor of the local populace, and a positive attitude of growth helps keep everyone on board. Coercive mandates, mandates, especially from foreign or international bodies, are an invitation for conflict and lack of cooperation. So we want to avoid that. We want to get everyone on board here. And I think it's a saleable topic. It is, it's going to require some salesmanship, but it can be done. OK, we also have to think about optimal human population size. Human population growth has been portrayed as an evil since the 60s and 70s with Paul Ehrlich and his population bomb, the limits to growth group, and so forth. These schemes tended to underestimate our planetary carrying capacity. Recall that the British Palestine colonial government thought that Palestine could only support 2 million people. It now supports 12 million people. This is a factor of six increase. Now, I'm not saying we should increase the human population size by a factor of six, but I think we have some space for growth here, particularly if humans are doing their part and helping the planet. And hypertopias are going to require a lot of energetic, awesome, educated young women and men like our uh, symbiosis homeschool group task force that we just heard from. Uh, with the active outdoorsy jobs managing the reforestation projects and the hypertopia communities, this new generation will help propel wholesome economic growth and thus will benefit the entire global economy. So if we get this going, we will have the eco economic growth plus the improving environment. Okay, so this then takes us then to the concept of oases of creation. And it's my contention that a purely secular attitude toward planetary restoration courts failure. It's just not going to work. Hypertopias must include not merely churches and faith communities, but also monasteries and convents. And uh, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI uh, expressed this theme, and I'm sure that Pope Francis would agree with him here, are not the oases of creation that spring up, say, around the Benedictine monasteries, and here's the Benedictine Abbey of Proglia near Padua, uh, <clears throat> are not the oases of creation that spring up, say, around Benedictine monasteries in the West, foreshadowings of this reconciliation of creation <clears throat> brought about by the children of God, just as, conversely, something like Chernobyl, that our homeschooler symbiosis task force mentioned, is a shocking expression of creation's enslavement in the darkness of God's absence. So we really do need some supernatural help here. And in fact, on the back of your program, we have a quotation from Mother Teresa. We know only too well that what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. But if the drop were not there, something would be missing from the ocean. OK, so we need to put our drop in the ocean. We need to do our part that will help stabilize uh, planetary climate and at the same time 
grow the human population and provide new and wholesome opportunities for our young people and, and make it clear to everyone that there is a positive future here and we can look forward to that if we do our part and do it well. Thank you.